New information emerges in the Jacob Blake shooting. The RNC begins with a bang as Republicans hit on crime, COVID, and communism. And Nikki Haley and Tim Scott compete for speech of the night. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Protect your online privacy today at expressvpn.com slash Ben. Well, we'll get to the opener of the Republican National Convention, which was really well produced. I mean, much better produced than the DNC, which had all sorts of sort of technological hiccups. The the RNC actually ran very smoothly, which you would expect from President Trump. I mean, the fact is that there's one thing President Trump knows, and that thing is reality TV. And so the convention was actually quite well produced. We'll get to everything convention related in just one second. First, I need to give you an update on the Jacob Blake case. So I suggested yesterday that perhaps we should wait for more information, you know, because we needed more information. And all we had was a grainy piece of footage that was taken from across the street, the first seconds of which were completely cut off, and which showed Jacob Blake, a 29-year-old black man, walking away from police whose guns were drawn on him, and then he reaches into a car, and then they shoot him. And this prompted the likes of Joe Biden to issue awful statements on this whole thing, jumping to the conclusion that this was once again systemic American racism against black Americans, an unjustified shooting of an unarmed black man caught on camera, that nothing had preceded it, Everything just happened the way that that Benjamin Crump, the attorney, said. Remember, Benjamin Crump's claim was that Jacob Blake was a a good Samaritan who basically had gone to break up a fight between two women and then had walked away. And the cops, for no reason, just decided to follow him and shoot him. Well, it turns out that shock of shocks, that was not, in fact, the case. First of all, it turns out, as we knew yesterday, that Jacob Blake, there's an open warrant out on Jacob Blake for things including sexual assault and domestic violence. And Joe, none of this stopped Joe Biden from putting out the statement. Yesterday, Joe Biden put out the following statement about the Jacob Blake shooting in the absence of any surrounding evidence, right, without waiting for any new evidence to come out. He said, yesterday in Kenosha, Wisconsin, Jacob Blake was shot seven times in the back as police attempted to restrain him from getting into his car. His children watched from inside the car and bystanders watched in disbelief. Now, no, no mention of the fact that this was a man for whom there was an arrest warrant out with three kids in the back of his car. Now, typically, if you have a guy out, an arrest warrant out on a guy for domestic violence and sexual assault of a minor, which is what this was. It was sexual assault of a 15-year-old, I believe, was, was the actual case that they're talking about, according to statutory law, somebody underage. The Typically, you don't let that person get in the car with kids and drive away. But in any case, Joe Biden wrote, his children watched from inside the car and bystanders watched in disbelief. And this morning, the nation wakes up yet again with grief and outrage that yet another black American is a victim of excessive force. So he's just going to go right with the excessive force line. This calls for immediate, full and transparent investigation And the officers must be held accountable. So he already knows the outcome of the investigation, which is magic. And I definitely trust Democrats on preliminarily jumping to conclusions, considering that Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren and many members of the Democratic Party are still claiming years later, after two independent prosecutorial investigation state prosecutors in Ferguson, Missouri, and one Obama DOJ investigation, that the shooting of Michael Brown was not, in fact, a murder. It was a justified shooting by a police officer. They're still claiming it's a murder. So I definitely trust these people when it comes to their assessment of criminality. Joe Biden said, these shots pierced the soul of our nation. Jill and I pray for Jacob's recovery and for his children. Equal justice has not been real for black Americans and so many others. We are at an inflection point. We must dismantle systemic racism. So this was an element of systemic racism, apparently. He still didn't know whether the shooting was unjustified. He still had no evidence, even if it was unjustified, that it actually had anything to do with racism. It is the urgent task before us. We must fight to honor the ideals laid in the original American promise, which we are yet to attain, that all men and women are created equal, but more importantly, that they must be treated equally. Well, let me just point out that if a person resists arrest, by which we mean that the person resists arrest to the point where apparently there are reports that that he was tased and he walked away from it and he was throwing off officers and then reaches into their car, I have a feeling the cops don't let white people get away with that either. Just as a general rule. Okay, in any case, new tape emerges from a different angle. The, the cell phone video is not particularly good, but you can get like a brief view here of what's going on. So this is the other side of the SUV where Jacob Blake was shot shortly before you see him walking around the other side of the car and being shot. If you pause it right there, you can see that Jacob Blake is basically on the ground, right? And then he shakes the officers loose, as you're about to see, and he gets up and he starts walking away from the officers who now have their weapons drawn because he's resisting arrest. And so this is what the tape shows. Right, he literally throws off the officers. He's, he's struggling. He's resisting arrest. People are standing around shouting at the police officers. He gets up and he starts walking around the car. Now, if you're a police officer and he has just shrugged you off, right? He has just fought you off and he reaches into the car. Are we under the impression that he is reaching into the car and he reaches down into the car? That he's reaching down into the car for like what exactly? His ID? 
I mean, what, what exactly is he reaching for at that point? If you're a cop, you are trained in that situation that if somebody reaches into the car after having resisted arrest, that there's a good shot that that person might be going for something that is not going to be good for you. Okay, so in any case, does this mean that the shooting was justified? No, we don't have enough evidence still. We still don't know. But is this the original story we were told by Benjamin Crump? That this was a man who was just breaking up a fight between a good Samaritan, breaking up a fight between two women, and then just calmly walking back to his car when he was accosted for no reason by the police? Is that what you see on that tape? So bottom line is this. Maybe everybody should wait for more evidence to come out. I know, controversial. Maybe everybody should wait for more evidence to come out. But no, we jump to the conclusion that this is systemic American racism. Always and forever. This is the line. Systemic American racism is always what is to blame for every situation that you don't like, whether or not there is evidence. The officers involved in the shooting are already placed on administrative leave. They are said to be cooperating with investigators, according to the Wisconsin Department of Justice, and the state DOJ has already launched an investigation into the shooting. Meanwhile, the police union representing the officers on the Kenosha Police Force released a statement on Monday criticizing Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers, who immediately condemned the excessive force used by cops. Pete Dates, the president of the Kenosha Professional Police Association, said anytime deadly force is used, our hearts go out to those affected by it. We assure you an independent investigation is being conducted by the Wisconsin DOJ Division of Criminal Investigation. But none of that matters because the riots started. And the riots, people really don't like furniture and they really don't like cars. The, the police association said until the investigation is complete, we ask that you withhold prejudgment about the incident and please let the process take place. Governor Evers' statement on the incident was wholly irresponsible and not reflective of the hardworking members of the law enforcement community, not to mention the citizens of the city of Kenosha. As always, the video currently circulating does not capture all the intricacies of a highly dynamic incident. We ask that you withhold from passing judgment until all the facts are known and released. This seems reasonable. We, along with citizens of the great city of Kenosha, ask for peace to let the process play out fairly and impartially. But nope, we're not going to do any of those things. And so last night, Kenosha burned. Because this is how it works. Politicians decide they can make hay off of claiming that America is systemically racist. In no way does this make America a better place. In no way does this improve race relations in the United States. When you claim that every individual incident is an indicator, a symptom of a broader systemic problem, and without evidence, then what you are doing is setting the scene for burning of cities. When you suggest that individual incidents without evidence must actually be racist, then what you are doing is something truly terrible. And you bear responsibility for what comes next. Okay, and that, that is what's happening right here. That is what's happening. You can see on this video in Kenosha, people, these are, I assume, white, uh, you can see in the video, it's, it's like white Antifa members probably, setting fires to that dumpster. That dumpster right there, that was a systemically racist dumpster. This is a dump truck right here. That is a systemically racist dump truck. I'm so glad they burned that dump truck. Now that bastard can't be systemically racist anymore. They also burned down a furniture store. So that was important because those couches were systemically racist. There were couches inside and those couches, some of them were white and some of them were brown. And we have no idea the proportionality. The couches were systemically racist. They also burned a bunch of cars, which was good because the cars were systemically racist. All of these objects were systemically racist. And it seems to me that the Black Lives Matter movement, which has resulted in this sort of chaos in major American cities across the country, I'm wondering what's the good it did. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Seriously, what is the good that it did? In fact, American perceptions of Black Lives Matter are back where they were before the George Floyd shooting, which demonstrates exactly how much goodwill the BLM movement has completely blown in the United States. As well they should have, because this behavior is indicative of a serious issue. Okay, when it turns out that protests routinely devolve into rioting and looting, perhaps there is a problem. We're gonna get to more of this in a second. By the way, the, the New York Times headline, I should just say, the New York Times tweeted out, this was their tweet about Kenosha being burned last night, quote, Peaceful marches in Kenosha, Wisconsin, against the police shooting of a black man gave way to fires and destruction. Oh, they just gave way, did they? Fascinating. So if the anti-lockdown protests had devolved into burning down Capitol buildings, would they have just given way? Or would it have been that the protesters turned out to be rioters and looters? Is that what it have turned out to be? The New York Times headline, by the way, on all this was fires in Kenosha reflect anger after police shooting of Jacob. Well, the fires reflected the anger, not the people were angry, and so they randomly burned down businesses and burned down a church with a giant sign that said Black Lives Matter in front. The fires themselves reflected anger. Incredible. Incredible. See, this, in the leftist way of thinking, unfortunately, in the far left way of thinking, the angrier you are at the system, the more the system is to blame for your anger. Therefore, your anger is always justified, and any resistance to the system is justified as well. 
In fact, if you really want to show how bad the system is, you burn crap because that demonstrates how an- you wouldn't be this angry if the system weren't corrupt. Right? That you wouldn't be this angry for no good reason. Barack Obama said this directly about the Ferguson, Missouri riots. When those were happening, after the officer, Darren Wilson, was acquitted, after that, after the grand jury didn't indict, Barack Obama went out there and said, people don't just make this stuff up. Except that in that particular case, everything was actually made up. But the idea is the more angry you are, the more you must be justified in your anger, which of course is an outright lie. It's an outright lie. We don't know what happened in the Jacob Blake case. And we do know what happened in this Chicago case where everybody decided to ransack the loop. They ransacked the loop after hearing that a 15-year-old boy was shot for no reason by the cops. It turned out to be a 20-year-old man who was shooting at the cops. So it turns out people make up crap all the time. White, black, and green. People make up crap all the time that helps their case. That doesn't justify this sort of behavior. And it undermines whatever you're attempting to do, for sure. And now, in a second, we're going to get to how this plays in Peoria, because this does have a significant impact on the election. We'll get to that in one moment. First, let us talk about the fact that hiring these days can be particularly difficult. There are a lot of people who are looking for jobs. There are a lot of employers who are looking to hire up. How do you match the employer with the employee? Well, this is where ZipRecruiter comes in. ZipRecruiter will send your job to over 100 of the web's leading job sites. They don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and then actively invites them to apply to your job. ZipRecruiter makes the entire hiring process efficient and effective with features like screening questions to filter candidates and an all-in-one dashboard where you can review and rate your candidates. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the very first day. Right now, to try ZipRecruiter for free, my listeners can go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. That is ZipRecruiter.com slash D-A-I-L-Y-W-I-R-E, ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Let's say, for example, that you had somebody who worked at your office, like a town crier. Let's, let's call him Pavel, for example. And let's say that each morning, he just started announcing out of the blue that he had 10 seconds to airtime when the teleprompter wasn't even up yet. You might think to yourself, well, Pavel, love you, man, but... ZipRecruiter it is for you. If you need to replace someone like Pavel, you need to check out ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. That is ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Okay, so the headline from the New York Times again is that Jacob Blake shooting prompts tense protests and fires in several cities. Oh, did it prompt fires? Did it prompt the fires? Weird, because it seems that fires don't break out on their own. It seems like it prompted a bunch of violent maniacs to go out and do violent, maniacal things. Who would have thought, but you can't, you can never devolve agency on people who do bad things. The system is always to blame for bad things happening. This is the common thread in so much leftward thinking, and it is wrong nearly all the time. Individual behavior, as it turns out in a free country, is generally attributable to the individual. It is not attributable to the system. We have moved from in a, a view of racism in the United States that racism is a barrier to people making free decisions to people making free and bad decisions is a result of racism. That is a wide difference. Okay, it used to be that Americans were angry at racism because actual instances of racism deprived people of the ability to make decisions that were good for themselves. Now people make active bad decisions for themselves and their neighbors, and we blame racism for the active bad decisions they're making. They have no agency whatsoever. That's the way all these headlines are phrased from the New York Times. Julia ba- Julie Bosman, a reporter from the New York Times, writes like this. Peaceful marches in protest of a police shooting gave way to fires, destruction, and looting in Kenosha as a strip of businesses in a central residential neighborhood was consumed in flames early Tuesday. Residents emerged from their houses overnight to gape at billowing smoke that could be seen for miles. Lost in the blaze, neighbors said, was a mattress store. Well, those mattresses were systemically racist. I mean, let's be honest about that. Those are some really, really systemically racist mattresses. A storefront church? I mean, that I can't think of anything more systemically racist than a storefront church. A Mexican restaurant? I mean, my God, the cultural appropriation. I mean, even if it's owned by Mexican Americans, that, that's cultural appropriation. A cell phone store? Cell phone, systemically racist, as we know. Less than a mile away, a probation and parole office was also on fire. The National Guard was called in. BLM has been burning cities. BLM has been destroying cities. Something like over 30 people have died in the current BLM riots. Some 30 people have died in the BLM riots. Okay, and people are getting shot. People are getting killed. Okay, it is, it, it's, it's obviously the police, right? It's obviously that the cops are the ones who are, who are most at fault here when we watch cities burn. Okay, so all of this has a relatively large political impact. Okay, so that was the basis for the RNC last night. The Democrats completely ignored this for like a full-on week. For a full-on week, the Democrats completely ignored everything that was going on in these major cities. And it turns out Americans care about it. There are polls that demonstrate that Americans care about it. There's a Pew poll that came out last week. 59% of Americans say they are deeply worried about increased violence in America's major cities, which they should be. 63%, by the way, say they are concerned about coronavirus. So that means that this is a top priority and Democrats completely ignored it. 
So it's not surprising that Republicans decided that they were going to push on this particular issue as well they should. That's particularly true given that President Trump's strategy here is apparently to win over some of the people in the middle, but it is also to drive out rural votes in the same way that he did in 2016. Okay, that strategy could bear fruit given the media's unwillingness to cover this stuff honestly, given the Democrats' unwillingness to call out evil and violence for exactly what it is. Okay, we'll get to more of this in just one second. We'll get started with the RNC in just one second. First, you've heard me talk about how important it is to have a VPN. Now that a lot of you are working from home, it's even more important to choose a VPN that you trust. I can say with full confidence, ExpressVPN is the best VPN on the market, and here's why. Number one, ExpressVPN doesn't log your data. Lots of really cheap or free VPNs that make money by selling your data to ad companies. ExpressVPN has developed a technology called Trusted Server that makes it impossible for their servers to log any of your information. Number two, speed. I've tried a lot of VPNs in the past. Many slow your connection down or make your device sluggish. I've been using ExpressVPN for literally years at this point. My internet speeds are always blazing fast, and my internet activity is always protected. Also, ExpressVPN, really easy to use. You can install it basically with the click of a button. With one more click, it's now running on your computer and you're protected. It's not just me saying this. Wired, seen at the verge, many other tech journals rate ExpressVPN the number one VPN in the world. So protect yourself with the VPN I use and trust. Use my link at expressvpn.com slash Ben today. Get an extra three months for free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash Ben. Visit expressvpn.com slash Ben to learn more. Again, that's E-X-P-R-E-S-S vpn.com slash Ben and you get an extra three months free on a one-year package. Meanwhile, the RNC began last night and it began on an upbeat note. There were, there were a couple of themes that were pressed last night. One was America is a great place, which is something that the Democrats did not say. The entirety of the convention, it was America is a horrible hellscape. And you can tell by the way the media are covering it, how dishonest the media are. So the media proclaimed that basically Trump downplayed, that the RNC and the Trump campaign downplayed America last night. It was a dark vision of America. No, that was the DNC, where they were claiming that America was systemically racist, that everybody in America was going to die from COVID, that we were living on the verge of dictatorship. That was the that was the campaign, night after night, last week. Barack Obama said, we are literally living on the verge of a dictatorship. Michelle Obama said, there's a never-ending list of black Americans being murdered by the cops. So if you're going to talk about dystopian hellscape views of the United States, it's pretty obvious that the Democrats were pushing that line. But since the gaslighting by the media has gone so incredibly far, we've now reversed the narrative. And the narrative is that when Republicans talk about how America is a great place, yes, there are problems here, but America is an incredible place founded on good principles and that we are getting past COVID and that we are working to solve problems and that we can do this if granted freedom. The media played this as though we were, da as though as though Republicans have a dark vision of America. No, Americans have a dark vision of Marxism. Republicans have a dark vision of the future that Democrats would like to see pervade. And frankly, looking at America's major blue cities, I have no, no reason to, to doubt that particular narrative. My favorite headline, by the way, of the day had nothing to do with the RNC. My favorite headline of the day was the LA Times being very, very angry that Republicans keep beating up on California. It's, it's, it, it was pretty incredible. Here was the LA Times headline last night. Speakers at the RNC turned California into a dystopian punchline, portraying America's most populous state as a dangerous wasteland ruled by liberal politicians who are oblivious to public safety. No, actually, it turns out that Democrats turned California into a dystopian punchline. Um, I live here. They have turned this place into a hellscape. I was talking to producer Nick. And let me tell you something. Producer Nick is the kind of guy who likes to hunt bears in the woods with like just a knife. It brings a torch and a knife to the woods to hunt bears. He went down to Santa Monica. He's like, I'm not going to survive here. I'm leaving in like the next 37 seconds. Producer Nick is the kind of guy who dates women who train wolves. And producer Nick went down to Santa Monica and he's like, um, this is this is quite awful. I think we need to leave. Okay, California has turned into hellscape because of Democrats, because of Democrats. But the media are like, how dare Republicans portray major American cities that are on fire, overrun with homelessness and poverty? How dare they, how dare they portray these places as bad? Okay, so the actual narrative last night is that America is quite wonderful and it is filled with wonderful people. And Democrats keep telling you that your neighbors are racist and terrible people while simultaneously saying the government will solve all of your problems and solving none of them. The RNC opened on an optimistic note. So there was a video narrated by John Voigt. It was quite good. There was a lot of focus at the RNC on the quote unquote common man, a lot more than there was at the Democratic Party National Convention. The DNC was based almost entirely on the idea that Donald Trump is a bad orange man who's bad in orange, as we discussed last week. There was very little focus on the middle class or low income Americans and what Democrats are going to do to uplift them. There was almost no focus on policy. There was certainly no focus on the riots and the looting. Instead, it was America systemically racist and Joe Biden, the octogenarian political animal who's been there for 50 years, is going to be your, your beacon of light in the wilderness. 
Republicans went in a different direction. They made an overt play for people who are middle and, and lower income. And they made an overt play for people who are fearful of what's going on in America's major cities. And here is the opening video narrated by uh, my friend John Voight. We are America. Despite unpredictable events, we as Americans work together to overcome challenges, write our own stories. The legends for our posterity. America. Land of promise. Land of opportunity. Land of heroes. Land of greatness. And that's good stuff. There's nothing wrong with this sort of patriotism. I know that at the DNC, people were trying to elide under God from the early hours of the DNC before you saw them in primetime and then lie about it by having Joe Biden do the have his grandkids do the Pledge of Allegiance and sing the national anthem. But there's no question which party has, has a greater sense of patriotism. I mean, that, that's pretty obvious at this point, is it not? I mean, the entire Democratic Party platform is that America is systemically racist and terrible. And then Joe Biden tries to buy it back a little bit so he can pretend to be moderate. And then the RNC did something that I thought that they absolutely needed to do. I've been preaching it for weeks on this program. I said it would be political malpractice if they did not do it. They played a video of various Democratic governors saying that Donald Trump gave them what they needed when it came to COVID, which I've been urging the Trump administration to do for quite a while. And people were shocked by the brilliance of it. Don't be shocked. I told you they were going to do this for weeks, or at least that they should. Here was a little bit of that video. Andrew Cuomo and company praising Trump's response to COVID. He said everything that I could have hoped for. Promise made, promise kept. He is ready, willing, and able to help. He has been responsive. He's done a lot of good things. What the federal government did was a phenomenal accomplishment. In our hour of need, you all literally are helping us in a big way. We were at the edge, and this is life or death stuff, and we're forever thankful for that. Okay, that is true. I mean, the, the, all of these Democratic governors were praising President Trump on COVID. And now, of course, President Trump is the worst thing in the world. Trump also did a, a moment with the first responders. He appeared in a couple of different videos throughout the night where he was dealing with, you know, quote unquote, the common man. Uh, and uh, here he was speaking with first responders and thanking them. This is a good look for the president. These are the incredible workers that helped us so much with the COVID uh, we can call it many different things from China virus. I don't want to go through all the names because some people may get insulted, but that's the way it is. These are great, great people, doctors, nurses, a fireman, a policeman. We want to thank you all. You have been incredible and we want to thank you and all of the millions of people that you represent. Thank you all very much. Great job. Yes, I know thank you're allowed you. to thank the cops. You're allowed to thank the firemen. All of that's fine. It turns out all of that's good. All that's good. Turns out that, that police officers particularly were a particular focus of the RNC last night. They should be because when they leave, you know what's been happening in the cities? Have you been watching? Okay, in just a second, we're going to get to that theme, which was pushed very heavily last night. The, the Trump campaign really made a heavy pitch last night for particularly black voters. So there are good polls, like a lot of them, showing that Trump is actually outperforming where he was last time with the black vote, that it is not as monolithic as the Democrats have assumed. If Trump makes significant inroads into the black vote, the Democrats have a real problem on their hands. This election's a lot closer than some of these polls are suggesting. Chris Wallace pointed that out last night. He's correct. We'll get to more of this in just one second. First, many of us have become expert homebodies these last few months, but there is a downside to not leaving your home, which is that often we exercise less. And that's why I love Echelon. Echelon has a huge lineup of connected fitness bikes, fitness mirrors, rowing machines that give you a fun, challenging workout from the comfort and safety of your home. In as little as 20 minutes, you can get into the best shape of your life and be active with the entire family. The world-class instructors will motivate you with daily live and on-demand classes that are always available when you need them. And unlike their competitors, Echelon is affordable for everyone. Their EX1 connected fitness bike is less than half the price of a Peloton. So I actually looked at getting a Peloton for the wife, and then we could have cut a, a Peloton commercial. And then it turns out that it was so damned expensive. I was like, well, I, I don't think we're going to do that. And so we ended up with an Echelon, and it is absolutely fantastic. My wife loves it. With Echelon financing, you can try them out risk-free for 30 days, zero down, as little as $46 per month. Don't pay a ton for a Peloton. Instead, go check out Echelon. I mean, you're talking about a quality bike with classes, the whole thing. Go to echelonfit.com slash Ben. That's E-C-H-E-L-O-N fit.com slash Ben. Echelonfit.com slash Ben. Go check them out right now. It really is a fantastic, fantastic product. Okay, so the there are a couple themes that the Republicans hit on last night. As I mentioned, they, they really made a play for black voters last night. And I know that the, the Democrats think the way you appeal to black voters is by suggesting that, 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 that America is systemically racist and the police are evil. It turns out that 81% that of black Americans want the same number of police or more in their communities. That the vast majority of black Americans are not, in fact, living below, below the poverty line. 
that black Americans are by and large middle class, that black Americans actually want safety and security in their communities, that the lie that has been promulgated by the media and in pop culture, that all black Americans are desperate to get the police out of their communities and that they are warm toward criminality is a lie that has been a lie for decades. And yet that lie is promulgated by the media specifically in order to quote unquote blame America for criminality problems that exist among individual black Americans, which is ridiculous. And so several Republicans hit on the, the crime point. And then there were several kind of big name and, and very impactful black speakers at the RNC last night. Of course, it was closed out by Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina. So Jim Jordan hit on the point that Democrats basically are allowing evil to happen in our major cities while preventing you from going to work in school. This is true. There's no way around this. It is absolutely true. In LA, they're trying to shut down private schools while they permanently allow major protests, while they've allowed looting to ransack half the city. I mean, it really is incredible. Here is Jim Jordan, the Republican congressman from Ohio, making this point. Democrats refuse to denounce the mob and their response to the chaos, defund the police, defund Border Patrol, and defund our military. And while they're doing all this, they're also trying to take away your guns. Look at the positions they've taken in the past few months. Democrats won't let you go to church, but they'll let you protest. Democrats won't let you go to work, but they'll let you riot. And Democrats won't let you go to school, but they'll let you go loot. Yep, yep. And, and for security moms, you know, people who are living in the suburbs, that makes a difference because this is starting to invade the suburbs. I mean, you're seeing BLM rioters, protesters, in some cases, the same groups, who are going into suburbs and screaming at people to keep them awake at night. This is not relegated to city centers anymore. Right? People wonder why there is there, there seems to be more ire by more Americans at BLM these days. Well, that is why. That is why. Because this, this supposedly started off as a righteous crusade, and it quickly overthrew those boundaries and turned into a, a, a crusade to destroy virtually all American founding principles. There's a reason that Nicole Hannah-Jones, the de facto editor of the New York Times, says that uh, she's proud that these are the 1619 riots. Okay, so th this was one message. Right. One, one of the messages here is that the, the Democrats keep defending criminality. Mark and Patricia McCloskey, uh, that's the famous couple from St. Louis, whose gated community was broken into by Black Lives Matter rioters, and it turns into criminality when you break into a gated community. And then they held guns outside their house and were then prosecuted by a St. Louis prosecutor who was seeking to maintain electoral advantage. They spoke at the, at the RNC last night and made the point that the Democrats are defending criminals, they're not defending citizens. It seems as if the Democrats no longer view the government's job as protecting honest citizens from criminals, but rather protecting criminals from honest citizens. Not a single person in the out-of-control mob you saw at our house was charged with a crime. But you know who was? We were. They've actually charged us with felonies for daring to defend our home. Okay, and that is right. And I think more and more Americans are picking up on this. You know, the media have basically blacked out all coverage of the of the violence, or they've treated it as the predictable side effect of systemic American racism. Most Americans are not up for this. They absolutely are not. And meanwhile, the RNC made a pitch for black voters. So Herschel Walker, who's been a longtime friend of President Trump, he played for the New York Generals when, when Trump was an owner in the USFL. So Herschel Walker spoke at length about his friendship with President Trump. And it was a good speech. He gave a good speech last night. Here he was. I've known Donald Trump for 37 years, and I don't mean just casual ran into him from time to time. I'm talking about a deep personal friendship. He taught me that the family should be your top priority. I watch him treat janitors, security guards, and waiters the same way he would treat a VIP. He made them feel special because he knew they were. He understands that they are the people who make this country run. They clean, they cook, they build, they drive, they deliver. Okay, all of this is good, right? And Walker also said, listen, you can love both social justice and the American flag. You don't have to be on the side of flag burners in order to believe that sometimes change is necessary. Here's Herschel Walker. Just because someone loves and respects the flag, our national anthem and our country, doesn't mean they don't care about social justice. I care about all those things. So does Donald Trump. He shows how much he cares about social justice in the black community through his actions. And his actions speaks louder than stickers or slogans on a jersey. Okay, by the way, this led, because Twitter is a garbage place filled with garbage people, this led the term Uncle Tom to trend on Twitter last night and this morning. Well, well done, everybody. So a black man thinks differently than you think he ought to think, lefties. 
and he becomes an Uncle Tom. Right? He's a sellout to black people everywhere. Well, apparently, among other sellouts was Vernon Jones. So Vernon Jones is a state Georgia legislator, and he supports President Trump. And he says, you know, when I endorse Trump, all hell broke loose because I'm expected to think a certain way. Now, you know, when I made the public announcement of my support for President Trump, all hell broke loose. I was threatened, called an embarrassment, and asked to resign by my own party. Unfortunately, that's consistent with the Democratic Party and how they view independent thinking black men and women. Okay, and this is absolutely true, obviously, is that the, the Democratic Party views the black community as a, an exclusive preserve for their policies, and they should not, because it turns out there are a lot of black Americans who are not really fond of watching their cities burn while excuses are made for the burning by Democrats and by the media. And we'll get to more of this in just a second, and the big name guests of the convention. Some were good, some were not so good. We'll get to all of that, the breakdown coming up. First, if you need legal help for your challenges, LegalZoom has proven to be a reliable resource for families and business owners everywhere during these unprecedented times. LegalZoom has been dedicated to helping you with the right solutions for more than 19 years. Whether you need a will or a living trust to protect your family, or if you need help starting a business the right way with a DBA, LLC, nonprofit, or more, LegalZoom can help you do it. It's easy to get started online. And if you need guidance, their network of attorneys can provide legal advice to ensure you're making the right choices. Since LegalZoom is not a law firm, you won't have to leave your home. You won't get charged by the hour. There's really no reason at all for it to be charged too much for your lawyering when you can do all of this quickly and easily using LegalZoom. I've been using LegalZoom for years myself, long before they were a sponsor on the show. You can use it for wills. You can use it for trust. And now they have an entire legal team that will help you online as well. Visit LegalZoom.com today to take care of some important things you need to get done. That's LegalZoom.com. Go check them out right now. LegalZoom.com. Again, when you check out LegalZoom, you're going to get all sorts of great services, and it's easy to get started, and they have a network of attorneys. It's not just a bunch of forms. They have a network of attorneys that can provide you legal advice. So save money right now over at LegalZoom.com. Go check them out right now. Okay, we'll get to more of the RNC in just a moment. There were a couple big-name speakers who did great last night. There was one who didn't do so great last night. But if you haven't heard by now, Joe Biden is officially the Democratic Party's presidential nominee for 2020. We know this because we made Matt Walsh watch his acceptance speech as part of our Daily Wire All Access Live DNC watch party. It was pretty traumatizing for him. I hope he will survive. This week, we have an even better lineup of All Access Live to watch the RNC with you over at dailywire.com. Starting tonight, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, our own Andrew Clavin will be live streaming President Trump's speech and watching with you taking your comments and questions, letting you know what he thinks as well. We'll be hosting more live watch parties every day for the rest of the week, so don't miss out. All Access members get to join these All Access Live sessions where one of us hops on every night to chat with you both in live stream and also in the comments. All Access membership also features not just one, but two leftist tiers tumblers with your membership, as well as early and sometimes exclusive access to new Daily Wire products. So head on over to dailywire.com slash Shapiro right now to get 20% off All Access with coupon code ACCESS. That's dailywire.com slash Shapiro with coupon code ACCESS to get 20% off your membership today. You're listening to the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. All righty. So other speakers were great last night. As I say, there, there are a bunch of black Republicans who spoke, I thought, quite wonderfully and eloquently about the fact that Democrats have simply assumed that the black vote is there for them. Kimberly Klasek who is a candidate in Baltimore for Congress uh, in Elijah Cummings' old district. She cut a great ad the other day about the destruction that Democratic rule has wrought in Baltimore. Well, she spoke at the RNC and she was terrific. Sadly, the same cycle of decay exists in many of America's Democrat-run cities. And yet the Democrats still assume that black people will vote for them, no matter how much they let us down and take us for granted. We're sick of it. We're not going to take it anymore. The days of blindly supporting the Democrats are coming to an end. In Baltimore, we have the highest number of black Republicans in the entire country running for office this election cycle. Joe Biden believes we can't think for ourselves, that the color of someone's skin dictates their political views. We're not buying the lies anymore. You and your party have neglected us for far too long. Okay, this is all excellent, excellent stuff. Okay, other speakers who were great last night. Uh, there is a, a Cuban expatriate named Maximo Alvarez. Uh, who I believe will be a guest on our radio show a little bit later today. He was terrific. He contrasted the United States with communist countries and talked at length about why it is that America is a fantastic, fantastic place. This is a good reminder, gang, that people who have actually lived under tyranny understand just how wonderful America is and what it would mean to lose it. Here's Maximo Alvarez, who I thought was the most moving speaker of the night. 
I have seen people like this before. I've seen movements like this before. I've seen ideas like this before. And I am here to tell you, we cannot let them take over our country. I heard the promises of Fidel Castro, and I can never forget all those who grew up around me, who look like me, who suffered and starved and died because they believed those empty promises. They swallow the communist poison pill. Okay, and then he talked about the difference between communism and Americanism. He says America is the greatest country on earth. And by the way, this is somebody who should know. Here he is, Maximo Alvarez. I may be a Cuban born, but I am 100% American. This is the greatest country in the world. And I said this before, if I gave away everything that I have today, it would not equal 1% of what I was given when I came to this great country of ours, the gift of freedom. And the fact that this is a man who understands gratitude for the country he has been given, that's, that's the major difference in our politics. People who are grateful for the principles of the Declaration of Independence, people who are grateful for what they have been given, that they didn't hit a triple, they were born on third base, and people who have decided that all the good things in life are natural to life and that we can simply dispense with all of the systems that created those things because those systems are inherently bad and terrible. And so it wasn't all glory last night. There were a couple of speakers who are not particularly wonderful. The, the one who got the most attention, of course, was Kimberly Guilfoyle, the former Fox News host and, and Donald Trump Jr.'s parent. Uh, are they married yet? Uh, I think she's his girlfriend. Uh, Kimberly Guilfoyle um, spoke last night and forgot there was no crowd. So it got really, uh, really awkward. Here, here's a little bit of the awkwardness. President Trump is the leader who will rebuild the promise of America and ensure that every citizen can realize their American dream. Ladies and gentlemen, leaders and fighters for freedom and liberty and the American dream, the best is yet to come. And then resident silence. So that works when there's a crowd there, maybe. Um, but there was no crowd there. So uh, that got real awkward real fast. That was that was not. Not a, I mean, she, she used to be on TV, so that, that feels like not a really good TV decision. That person who actually was shockingly good last night was Donald Trump Jr. So there were a lot of people who were concerned that Donald Trump Jr. was going to just go out there and be over the top and wild. And actually, he was pretty good. Like, his speech was actually kind of shockingly good. He talked about the fact that the Democrats have been using COVID as an excuse to actually give away money to their rich Democratic friends. This is true. Like, Nancy Pelosi has stacked into the relief packages state and local tax deductions, right, which is a way for... California to charge insane levels of taxation and then take the money out from the federal government coffers, essentially. Here is Donald Trump Jr. going after that. After eight years of Obama and Biden's slow growth, Trump's policies have been like rocket fuel to the economy and especially to the middle class. Biden has promised to take that money back out of your pocket and keep it in the swamp. That makes sense, though, considering Joe Biden is basically the Loch Ness Monster of the swamp. For the past half century, he's been lurking around in there. He sticks his head up every now and then to run for president. Then he disappears and doesn't do much in between. Okay, well, he correct. Fact check true. Trump Jr. also went after the cancel culture that is being promoted by the Democrats. By the way, the cancel culture is so strong right now, and, and the insane level of censoriousness is so strong right now. There, there's a video that's going around on Twitter. It's pretty incredible. Of Black Lives Matter activists literally walking up to people at a Washington, D.C. restaurant and demanding that they raise their fists in a salute to black power. And when two people who are just sitting there are like, no, they start berating them publicly. Yeah, that, that is where we are as a country. And it ain't good. Here was Donald Trump Jr. going off on it last night. Joe Biden and the radical left are now coming for our freedom of speech. They want to bully us into submission. If they get their way, it will no longer be the silent majority. It will be the silenced majority. This has to stop. Freedom of expression used to be a liberal value, at least before the radical left took over. Now the Republican Party is the home of free speech, the place where anyone from any background can speak their mind and may the best ideas win. OK, and then he also added, by the way, when we dial 911, it would be nice if it didn't go to voicemail, because since the, the Democrats are intent on cutting the cops in the middle of major cities burning, that's probably a bad idea. 
What happened to George Floyd is a disgrace. And if you know a police officer, you know they agree with that, too. But we cannot lose sight of the fact that our police are American heroes. They deserve our deepest appreciation. Because no matter what the Democrats say, you and I both know when we dial 911, we don't want it going to voicemail. So defunding the police is not an option. Everything starts with safety and security. You can't have anything else without it. Okay, so these were all of the lead-up speeches. Then there were the two kind of concluding speeches, and they were both great. And these are both figures who are going to be very important to the future of the Republican Party. One is former ambassador to the UN and my spirit animal, Nikki Haley, and the other was Senator Tim Scott. Both of them gave, I thought, excellent speeches last night. The media have been trying to pretend that these were sort of outliers. right? The, the, The media's goal here is to pretend that the Republican Party is all of Trump's worst excesses, that it is not, in fact, comprised of candidates like Nikki Haley and Tim Scott. And so what they attempted to do is say, well, they're out of step with sort of the Trumpian base. No, they're they're really, really not. I mean, both of these figures are very popular inside the Republican Party. So Nikki Haley pointed out correctly that Joe Biden has basically taken the strategy of blaming America first for all problems in the world. This is absolutely true. Here is the, the former governor of South Carolina, former UN ambassador under President Trump, and a person with a great personal story, by the way. I mean, both Tim Scott and Nikki Haley are people who appreciate America because of their background, right? Nikki Haley is the daughter of two Indian immigrants and um, would never be treated, by the way, with the same sort of kid gloves that the media have treated Kamala Harris, who's the daughter of a Jamaican immigrant and an Indian immigrant. Uh, here's, here's Nikki Haley talking about Joe Biden blaming America first. I'll start with the little story. It's about an American ambassador to the United Nations. That ambassador said, and I quote, Democrats always blame America first. The year was 1984. The president was Ronald Reagan. And Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick's words are just as true today. Joe Biden and the Democrats are still blaming America first. And that is exactly right. Now, Nikki Haley got ripped up and down by the media last night. Why? Well, number one, because she was good, but mostly because she pointed out that America is not a racist country. She said, yes, there are racists here. Some people do racist things. I've been hit by those people, but America is not a racist country. Now, this is such an important distinction. Okay, I I have been personally targeted by anti-Semites for a lot of my career. In 2016, I was named the number one target of online anti-Semitism, an enormous amount of it springing from the alt-right. But I've been hit by anti-Semitism from members of the left. I've been hit with all sorts of harassment, right? There are lots of nasty people online. And in real life, there are lots of nasty people. Is that America's fault? It is not America's fault. You can actually have experienced bad things in America and not blame the entire country that gives you freedom. And that was a point Nikki Haley made eloquently last night, and the media decided to completely ignore In much of the Democratic Party, it's now fashionable to say that America is racist. That is a lie. America is not a racist country. This is personal for me. I am the proud daughter of Indian immigrants. They came to America and settled in a small southern town. My father wore a turban. My mother wore a sari. I was a brown girl in a black and white world. We face discrimination and hardship, but my parents never gave in to grievance and hate. This is a great point that you can criticize people in America. You can, if you spot racist incidents, you can fight them. You can fight racist obstacles. That doesn't mean the entire country is racist. It's such an important point. And the reason the Democrats hate Nikki Haley is because she has the credibility to say stuff like this. It's the same reason that they hate Senator Tim Scott. So Tim Scott spoke last night. He was excellent. And again, the media couldn't deal with it. So they just decided to treat Tim Scott as an outlier. Scott said the election is about the promise of America. This is exactly right. Here is the black senator from South Carolina, Republican. While this election is between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, it is not solely about Donald Trump and Joe Biden. It's about the promise of America. It's about you and me our challenges and heartbreaks, hopes and dreams. It's about how we respond when tackling critical issues like police reform, when Democrats called our work a token effort and walked out of the room during negotiations because they wanted the issue more than they wanted a solution. Exactly right. 
Okay, here's Tim Scott making the point that I've been making for weeks here. that when it comes to racism, Democrats are more interested in labeling everyone they don't like racist and labeling the system racist so that you will give them power than they are in actually solving problems. And Tim Scott should know, since he's the one who proposed the police reform bill, Democrats then filibustered. Scott also gave an inspiring message about the fact that this is an incredible country. He says, my family went from cotton to Congress in one lifetime. I know we're supposed to pretend that racial progress has not taken place. I know we're supposed to pretend like Isabel Wilkerson, that we're still living in a caste system in the United States. We're supposed to pretend like Ibram Kendi, that racism just went underground and reemerged as all of our soft systems of institutional power. It's a lie. Here is Tim Scott rebutting the lie. My grandfather's 99th birthday would have been tomorrow. Growing up, he had to cross the street if a white person was coming. He suffered the indignity of being forced out of school as a third grader to pick cotton, and he never learned to read or write. Yet, he lived long enough to see his grandson become the first African American to be elected to both the United States House and the United States Senate in the history of this country. Our family went from cotton to Congress in one lifetime. And that's why I believe the next American century can be better than the last. Okay, isn't that a better message than the message being put forth by people like Kamala Harris, that America is systemically racist and that you're always behind the eight ball, or Michelle Obama, that there's a never ending list of black people being victimized in the United States right now? Isn't that a more inspiring and a truer message? So Scott says Democrats basically want to fundamentally transform the country, the same country that has allowed for that sort of progress. Again, correct, Senator Scott. Joe Biden's radical Democrats are trying to permanently transform what it means to be an American. Make no mistake. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris want a cultural revolution, a fundamentally different America. If we let them, they will turn our country into a socialist utopia. And history has taught us that path only leads to pain and misery especially for hardworking people hoping to rise. So the media's response to this was absolute abject horror that members of minority communities would dare speak as Republicans. My favorite version of this was George Stephanopoulos grilling Nikki Haley on racism because George Stephanopoulos, who is the whitest person in America, the Keebler elf, grilling Nikki Haley, the daughter of two Indian immigrants, on racism because George Stephanopoulos knows racism. I mean, that's a man who knows racism, obviously. Here he was suggesting that Nikki Haley is truly making room for racists because she's supporting President Trump. I ask you what President Trump has done to heal that racial divide. And, you know, you wrote that you were deeply disturbed by President Trump's comments after Charlottesville. Since then, he's tweeted out a video of his supporters chanting white power, praised the Confederate flag, which you called divisive in your speech last night. So I'll ask the question again. What specifically has President Trump done to address this systemic racism, the racial divide? Well, I will tell you, first of all, President Trump has passed criminal justice reform, which Obama and Biden didn't do. So my favorite thing from Democrats is when they question how President Trump has bridged the racial divide while Democrats are actively trying to widen the racial divide, actively doing it. It doesn't make excuses for all the bad things Trump has said over the course of his career. But right now, if you're looking at people who are actively attempting to create racial divides in the country, the Democrats, members of the media, but I repeat myself, are doing exactly that. That's what you're watching happen ad nauseum in Wisconsin right now. You're watching it happen day by day in the media right now. And they cannot stand the fact that Republicans, actually, there, there's some minority Republicans who disagree with that Democratic agenda. All righty, we'll be back here later today for two additional hours of content. Otherwise, we'll see you here tomorrow to recap night two of the RNC and whatever the, uh, the Black Lives Matter rioters and looters decide to burn tomorrow or tonight. Well, we'll give you all the updates. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. <laughs> The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Colton Haas. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Assistant director, Pava Wydowski. Our associate producer is Nick Sheehan. The show is edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Nika Geneva. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. Democrats burn down another city. Left-wing professors are calling for the abolition of the English language. And the RNC kicks off. Check it out in the Michael Knowles Show. Hey, 